welcome to Open Classroom, the Brown School's digital forum for important conversations. We are very, very glad that you're here. My name is Laurie McConnell. I'm communications coordinator here at the Brown School. Before we start, I want to just very quickly do a tiny bit of housekeeping just to let anyone uh, who's just joined us know that we're using a webinar format, which means that we can't hear you or see you, but we would love to know your thoughts and your questions. Please feel free to chat anytime. Just uh, click the little chat at the bottom of your Zoom screen, write us a message and uh, we will share those towards the end of the program. Also to let you know that we're streaming live right now on YouTube. So if you have a colleague or a friend who wasn't able to join us in this virtual room, but still wants to watch us live in just a moment, I'll put a link to that uh, YouTube live stream in our YouTube, uh, in the chat so that you can send folks to YouTube if they want to be part of this. I also want to let you know about some future open classrooms we have coming up. Uh, Tuesday, October 11th, that's next Tuesday, we continue with our iChat speaker series with digital innovations for improving the lives of people living with mental illness globally. Then uh, a week from today, Thursday, October 13th, we continue this Building a Transformative 21st Century Research Agenda series with collaborating with family peer advocates in child mental health research. And we have more from both of those series as well as our artificial intelligence series coming up as well. They're all free and they're better when you join us. So I will put a link to our open classroom website in the chat in just a moment as well. And uh, if you're welcome to register for any and all uh, webinars that interest you. But now to today's program, I'm going to introduce you to some of the lovely faces that you see on your screen. Uh, we're thrilled once again to have as a co-facilitator Cynthia Williams, who is Assistant Dean for Community Partnerships here at the Brown School at Washington University. We also have Nicholas Asher, Program and Project Assistant at Washington University, and an MSW and MSP candidate ready to graduate at the end of the year. They are going to collect your questions and thoughts that you put into chat and uh, ask those at the end. So as I said, feel free to write those down anytime they come to your mind. And then you probably already know Dr. Mary McKay. Uh, I think of Mary as researcher, author, educator, provost, president, and then some, uh, but uh, the officially, I guess, president of AASWSW, vice provost of interdisciplinary initiatives here at Washington University. Mary has been developing this series and facilitating all of these webinars. So Mary, I'm gonna let you introduce the other faces on the screen and let y'all start the discussion. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much for um, those kind words and Lori, for all that you do to organize us and our collaboration with Washington University and St. Louis, the Brown School. So um, so I, I do have many jobs, but I'm gonna welcome you as uh, and from my president role. Uh, I'm the president of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. And we have engaged in a really important collaboration um, with three foundations to really advance what we're calling the 21st century child research agenda, really meant to have science and research um, have a huge impact, a positive impact on the lives of children and families and the communities that they live in. Um, and so we're incredibly grateful that, for that collaboration. And Brittany, my colleague uh, from one of the foundations is gonna tell you a little bit about the 21st century research agenda. And then I'll come on back and introduce our speakers today. But Brittany, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sounds good, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm giving comments today on behalf of Peter Pecora, who's the managing director of research services for Casey Family Programs. Um, so I just actually started um, as a research analyst with Casey Family Programs. And I've been involved in the um, 21st century child welfare research agenda development process as a lived experience expert. So I was in foster care in Indiana, um, also just finished a, a PhD um, in human development and family studies at Purdue. So I kind of have both those, uh, the researcher hats uh, and, the, and the lived experience hat. So um, about, a little bit about the, the research agenda project. So since May of 2019, a diverse group of researchers, policy experts, DEI experts, and people with lived experience with the child welfare system have worked together to identify research gaps to enhance the development of a 21st century research agenda to, to support child and family well-being, as Mary said. So what began as a partnership between Casey Family Programs, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and the William T. Grant Foundation has evolved into a wider coalition of philanthropic and federal organizations, bolstered by extensive participation from individuals with lived experience in child welfare. So we believe that timely and targeted research should address the most critical issues facing the field so that findings can be used to support innovative policy change and changes in funding. 
So currently the Research Agenda Coalition is seeking funding to address the high priority research gaps um, and are actively promoting conversations about the following topic areas. So the first is transforming the research community by engaging researchers in how they see their role with study, um, study participants seen as partners in the research and prioritizing a commitment to social justice and equity. Also participation by community leaders and people with lived experience in the development of the research agenda, which we think lays the groundwork for the type of collaborations required to conduct research in close partnership with families, communities, and provider organizations. Um, there's also stakeholder involvement, guidance, and funding um, that can help researchers focus on the most critical issues. And in general, we're just trying to improve the field of research at the same time we help reform the child welfare system. So a more collaborative approach to research can have an important impact on policy program design and practice. Um, so these collaborative research appro approaches can help to ensure that research meets the needs of children, families, and communities and provider organizations, so not just researchers. So given this context, we're very pleased to have Kim and Robert um, speaking to these issues today. And I'll turn it back over to Mary to introduce those speakers for you. Wonderful. Thank you, Brittany. And um, for those of you that are interested in learning more about Brittany, um, she was my co-presenter just uh, a week ago on this series. And uh, we can put in the chat how you access you know, some of her extended remarks. So thank you so much, Brittany. You're an unbelievable partner. So now on to our speakers. Um, so, so I'm going to introduce uh, our three presenters to you in a, in a more personal way, given how much I admire them as humans and the work that they do and the values that they bring to this work. So Kimberly Holtwood has been just my longtime collaborator. I have learned, Kimberly, so much about how you can rapidly translate new knowledge into policy change um, and that, that how you've conducted yourself as a scientist over the last decades in partnership with families, with young people to really improve what we do for children and their families, I've admired greatly. And so thank you for organizing this panel. We have two exceptional uh, you know, partners uh, today, Anne Kumpacher and I worked on something called CTAC, which is the Community Technical Assistance Center of New York. Again, a platform that was meant to really rapidly translate knowledge into to action on behalf of children and their families. Um, Anne, you are what I think about is a family advocate leader, trainer, champion of the work of peers uh, really leading incredible transformation for kids and families. So I'm so happy that you are here. Robbie, you and I have just met. Um, and, and the words that are used to describe you are, are somebody that is interested in transforming and innovating systems so that young people have the support and the opportunities they need to, to survive and thrive. Um, Robbie, you've done a lot to organize training for youth peer advocates across New York State. Uh, creating curriculum, training models. And so I'm so excited that our audience can learn from you today. There will be three audiences uh, that will hear your remarks. Those of us that are together in person, thank you for coming in person. I'm also welcoming people on YouTube and uh, Nicholas will be sure that your comments are spread far and wide uh, to influence the way that research is done that on behalf of kids and families. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters and I look forward to your comments. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mary. Should I just jump in? I think the Please. slides are, yeah, okay. The slides are gonna be coming on up. So thank you very much, Mary. Thank you organizers of, for inviting us to talk about these issues around uh, family support, youth peer support, advocacy. Just on a, on a personal note, um, I worked at NIMH, National Institute for Mental Health, for 10 years from, let's see, 2000, from, no, from uh, 92 to 2002. And when I was being, being um, recruited for a position in New York, I was trying to decide, is this the right time to leave? A, what was a really a wonderful opportunity at NIMH. Who, the people I met with were the family peer advocates my first day in New York when I was trying to decide whether to come. I was so impressed with their passion, their smarts, their savvy, the way in which they were collaborating with the research community and with the state officials and the way this collaboration was helping to revitalize the issues around how do we really improve the system for children. That when I made the transition from the National Institute of Mental Health to New York State, 
what captured my imagination, my interest, and what made me, pushed me over the, the edge to say, yes, I'm going to come to New York, was the, the work of the family peer advocates in their partnership with the research community and with the state of New York, their passion, their commitment, their savviness, um, it, just amazing to me. And I thought, this is where I want to be. This is where we can actually transform the service system for children's mental health. And I have not been disappointed. So this is, this is an area that I, I really care about. And I'm so delighted to be able to present this with Anne and Robbie. Next slide. What I'm going to focus on is uh, what we know about the research on the types of peer support and the, the sort of unevenness, frankly, that exists in terms of the, the research support for this type of service. There, um, by and large, the, um, the, the types of peer support that have been around for a while are either for families and caregivers of children with mental health problems, peer support specialists, adult peers, so these are adults who have um, come out of the, the substance use or mental health systems and are working in a, a peer model. And then the, the newest kid on the block, really, quite frankly, is the youth and young adult peers. And you're going to hear from somebody who lives and breathes it and, and knows a lot about it. So I think it's important to think about these different types of peer support because the lived experience that families or caregivers versus adults versus young adults bring to their work is very different. And the credibility that they bring, the expertise they bring, their lived experience varies considerably. So these are, you can't just say peer support specialist and lump everybody together. These, these, are, these are different and the, the differences are important when it comes to the work that the, these peer support specialists do, how they are perceived, how they are integrated into the system. The types of services that tend to be provided by peer support specialists, whether they're family caregivers, adults, or young, young adults, are emotional, emotional support, instrumental, helping with you have an entitlement and you, you have not accessed it yet. So this would be a way to do that educational, instructional, sometimes called psychoeducation, and advocacy. Those are sort of the, the buckets in which the peer specialists tend to, to do their work. Now, beyond that, there are different ways in which and different parts of the system in which peer specialists are doing their work. It may be up front doing an assessment. It may be as part of a team providing that connection to provide the, the education to a, a parent or somebody who's coming in for services. There's a whole range of different content areas where peer support specialists work. But by and large, these are the types of, of supports that they provide. Next slide. When we look at the research on it, family peer support is, is where I'll start. There have this this work has been done for the past oh about 20 years, um, starting with some of the work out of the Fort Bragg study that uh, Len Bickman led and uh, Craig Ann Hefflinger. And family peer support has been found to improve self-efficacy, which basically means a sense that I know what to do, empowerment among the families who receive it, as well as it's associated with beginning services, completing services, in other words, staying engaged in services, increased knowledge about their child's condition, um, and importantly, that they are not to blame for it, but these are issues, problems, illnesses, if you will, that their children have that they are, uh, they are not to blame for. Increased knowledge about relevant services, satisfaction, and youth functioning at discharge. Next slide. Um, research has also shown that receiving family peer support services can be associated with better mental health on the part of the caregiver who has been working directly with, with the family um, peer specialist. Empowerment, child academic achievement in some cases has been linked to receiving this peer support. Um, knowledge and beliefs about children's mental health, which is a very important aspect of, of what a, a caregiver often needs to know so that they know how to push for the, the right kind of services and the highest quality services, the evidence-based services uh, very often. 
Uh, it's also been associated with decreased, uh, decreased conflict and negative communication, as well as hope. And hope can be very directly related to a decrease in stress. So there have been a number of studies that have shown these associations. What we haven't had yet, and what I think will become a research agenda, or I hope it will become a research agenda, are more head to four different categories, head to head comparisons between having a family peer specialist provide a particular service versus some other type of, of staff member or worker, a, a case manager, um, a social worker, a psychologist, et cetera. If, if the head to head comparisons haven't been done, there is a study in the field right now that will be doing that. But that would be one of the ways to help identify where does that power from family peer support come from? What, what you know, if we were to find that the outcomes were better with one versus another, then what, what's driving that? And that would lead to a series of questions about mechanisms, about um, why those effects are there or, or are not. Uh, so that would be a, a different uh, bucket of, of research questions. A third would be, is it best for what kinds of populations? Preventive services or services for caregivers whose kids have complicated histories? Those are all questions we don't have answers to. We have hypotheses, but that's about it. Um, the other issues around family peer support specialists has to do with the supervision issues. If you're working as family peer support specialist, who's going to be supervising you? What kind of training do they get? What, how does that work so that there is a, a, a clear career ladder for family peer support specialists if they're working in an agency, for example? So there are lots of questions. The research is just sort of scratching the surface, frankly, but it's very important, very intriguing, and there needs to be a lot more of it. Next slide. The adult uh, peer support role um, has had an even longer history of research, and there is quite a bit that has been, uh, has been studied about the role of the, the adult peer specialists and the uh, what it leads to in terms of the recipients of that. So an increased sense that treatment is responsive, increased sense of control, which is another way of talking about efficacy, um, increased um, empathy and acceptance, decreased psychotic symptoms. There, there have been um, even more studies in the adult peer support role, and that has included adult peer support specialists who are working either in mental health or in substance, uh, the substance use uh, systems. So I think there's a lot that we could be learning from that work to help inform the family peer specialists and the, the young adult peer specialists. But once again, as I said at the beginning, these really are separate types of, um, of roles. And the lived experience that is brought to bear on this work differs in important and meaningful ways that we don't want to lose sight of. Next slide. Um, finally, there are, uh, there are peer parents in the child welfare system, and I know that this, this particular open classroom um, has a real interest in child welfare. There is a recent review, very recent, this year, Child Abuse and Neglect, which looked at a range of peer parent programs in the child welfare system and did find uh, four of them that were positively associated with reuni reunification of the child with their family. Uh, that's a very important outcome, and it's, it's one that matters a whole lot, obviously, in the child welfare system. So I think this is, a, this is an important review paper. The results were mixed in terms of time and care and reentry, and so there are some, some nuances there and, um, and a lot more research to be done. Next slide. Uh, that's, that, is the, uh, that was my last slide. So uh, just, you know, once again, I, I, to me, this work is as important as it gets when it comes to being able to improve our service system. Um, I don't think I'm, I'm overstating the case to say our mental health system has let families and children down. It has done so for decades. Anyway, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ann Cuppinger, who's going to talk about the family support, and then Robbie, who's going to talk about the youth support. My, my last comment was just that our mental health system has let children and families down. And so I see that this family and young youth, young adult support work to be really critical to helping us better understand what it takes to make the system work. 
I'm going to stop at that. <laughs> Thanks, Kimberly. Um, it's really wonderful to be with you all today. And I'm just very excited about just the whole initiative because um, like Kimberly, you know, I start, I did work at the national level and I came to the state and was managing various programs. And then I stumbled upon uh, some family uh, peer advocates and youth advocates. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, this is, this is really, this is, this is what I need to pay attention to. And so for the last 30 years um, in various capacities, it's what I've been paying attention to. And it's brought me into the most wonderful partnerships um, with all kinds. Um, I think that um, really making, uh, putting an emphasis on including people with lived experience in all aspects of research is, is just gonna lead you to some really good places. Um, I find, I mean, even as recently as this morning, I was listening to a group of youth peer advocates, Robbie was facilitating a conversation, a webinar, and they just made me think differently about how we should be approaching this work. So um, I am just really excited about that. So Robbie and I are gonna give you a really quick overview of what's going on here in New York. Know that there is family and youth care activity happening in many, many places across the country, more or less, depending on what state and community you're talking about. Um, anytime you get involved in uh, research, wherever you are, I would encourage you to really reach out and figure out what's going on in that particular state. Tap into the statewide family-run organizations. Tap into, there's some states have really active child welfare family organizations. Really find out what's going on first so that you can build on what's happening rather than creating some other sort of set of activities that's not in sync with what's already going on. So next slide, please. So over the, you know, the this, this, process in New York, which has led to, today we now have 400 credentialed family peer advocates working throughout New York State and about 100 credentialed youth peer advocates. That credentialing and training process for youth peer advocates is a little bit younger. Um, but the only reason we've gotten to this point, um, and I think we will be expanding for various reasons in the next few years, is that there's been really good partnerships um, over time. The New York State Office of Mental Health um, really um, bought into the idea of family and youth peer support, started to fund it, um, and you know got the ball rolling. Um, Families Together in New York State, where Robbie works, is a statewide family-run organization. They um, obviously have been advocating for families, also for family and youth peer advocates um, for a long time. None of us, you know, even thinks about having a conversation about youth and families without involving families together in New York State. Um, CTAC, where I work, the Community Technical Assistance Center, and I also work at Ideas with Kimberly. We bring, you know, kind of the research um, expertise and also um, and CTAC is housed at NYU. So we bring that university um, kind of, uh, not just perspective, but infrastructure really to some of this work. Um, and again, everything we do on youth and families is in partnership with youth and families. So, uh, you know, we just try to do that from the beginning and sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't, but it is definitely um, our goal. Um, and then we also partner all the time with provider organizations and the FPAs and YPAs who are out there working in the field. Um, and it, because we really can, um, you know, from where I sit, you can easily lose perspective on what their day-to-day -day experience is and what the priorities are that they're dealing with. So, uh, you know, tap into all those systems as you do this work for success. Next slide, please. So just a little um, bit of background. So, uh, you know, family support and, and youth peer support really started as grassroots uh, kind of initiative. The, the advocates refer to it as around the kitchen table, you know, people just naturally helping each other. Um, we got a real boost from system of care grants and New York State had a number of them, which really required you to partner differently with children and families and hire family and youth care advocates. The state um, made grants that allowed for the expansion of family and youth care support. Less, the youth care came along and they, those grants were not as available for youth peers. And that's one of the reasons that it's been a little challenging to grow that piece of work. Um, uh, and recently, I, I guess it would be about five years ago now, we started um, uh, family youth care support was added to the Medicaid state plan. So now programs can bill for those services. Um, and we're, new, new service systems are getting involved. Families Together in New York State, which was previously very focused on the mental health system, has a big new initiative with child welfare. Um, juvenile justice is involved, obviously, and all of the other systems. And what I noticed from this many, you know, this perspective of 30 years is that now um, 
again, while imperfect, there is really um, a growing acceptance that any new initiative, any new program has to have a conversation about how family and youth care advocates are going to play a role and what family voice and choice should look like. Um, and those two go hand in hand. Uh, they're not exactly the same, but they are. it's important for the organizations to think about how they listen to youth and families so that then when they hire family and youth care advocates, they're not you know, really kind of clashing uh, in terms of values and practices. So um, over time, we defined a scope of practice, a code of ethics, training that was developed by, a, you know, really Kimberly got that ball rolling, the idea of developing training that was um, designed by and for the advocates themselves, as opposed to sort of plugging them into another training that really didn't fit their role. Um, and of course, there's been a number of research efforts along the way to sort of look at what we're doing and see if it's, uh, you know, how, how well it's working. Um, then after, once, you know, once we were going the direction of Medicaid, uh, we had to kind of formalize things a little bit more. So um, Families Together uh, developed uh, credentials for both family and youth peers. Um, and those credentials, again, help establish the legitimacy of this, of this work. Next slide. So there are still challenges, uh, you know, and it, we, I'd be remiss to not mention them, but like one of the problems is everybody's all, the systems are all still very siloed here and families don't operate like that. So, you know, what you get depends on what door you happen to walk through. And sometimes, uh, you know, there's, it, it doesn't all line up. So we have peer initiatives in every system of, in New York state. Um, and I would argue that we really should have one that's cross system and, you know, we're getting there in some ways, but it's still a struggle. There are significant workforce challenges. I know everybody's experienced them and it's no different with peers, um, but peers have the added challenge of the rates um, that, you know, are provided for peer services sometimes are really not adequate to, to encourage people to get into and stay in the profession. There are also sometimes a lot of rules associated with, for example, Medicaid funding that um, require peers to sort of, uh, you know, navigate that gap between how they'd like to operate and how they have to operate as a Medicaid uh, billable service. I think we're learning how to do that. Um, and partly what will make that work is having a variety of funding streams so that peers can really do all of the many things that they should be doing not just the, the few things that are Medicaid billable. Um, and again, we talked a little bit about organizational culture and how important it is to really invest in evaluating whether the organization is really ready to hire uh, family and youth peers, uh, not to let the uh, you know, perfect be the enemy of the possible, but to make sure that we're not setting things up um, for, for difficulties. And I think we're learning how to do that. So that's really exciting. Next slide. So I'm gonna turn it over to Robbie, who's gonna to talk to you a little bit more about how, um, how it works in terms of training and credentialing of the youth care advocates. Thank you, Anne. Hi, everyone. My name is Robbie Latieri. I'm the Youth Care Services Training and Credentialing Manager at Families Together in New York State. And I personally have my own lived experience in the mental health and healthcare systems as a young person. And so I initially came into uh, this field in the adult system and primarily in the mental health system. And then I heard about youth peer support and it rocked my world. And I was like, where were the youth peer advocates when I was receiving services? And so I'm so passionate and I'm so grateful that this service exists and I'm really excited to talk to you about it today. Next slide, please. All right, so at a glance, uh, youth peer support, it really, or, or youth peer advocates really offer developmentally and age appropriate opportunities to young people. So we're not only looking at the aspect that we are uh, supporting them uh, in connecting services or offering that emotional support or skill building. We really try to foster that youth engagement and that youth culture. Something that I was referencing earlier today, I was talking about, you know, when I was at, in a psychiatric hospital when I was a young person, and I, there were two clinicians there who were a little bit younger and dressed a little bit more casually than all the other service providers. And those two people were the ones who I really gravitated towards, even though I was only 14 and they were probably in their late 20s or early 30s. Being that they were a little bit closer in age to me and they looked a little bit more like me, a little bit more casual, it was that much more inviting for me to want to open up. And youth graduates really have that opportunity to be that person for young people. 
to say, hey, I've been in your shoes. Hey, I'm kind of close in age. Yeah, there is a big gap between a 14 year old and a 24 year old and so on. But we're trying to really cater to that age appropriate service. Next slide, please. So again, at a glance, uh, youth peer advocates offer one-on-one -on -one coaching and advocacy that could be emotional support or just uh, supporting them to develop skills necessary in their own lives. They're going to be facilitating different support groups. They're going to be promoting uh, youth engagement. So whether that is at their school, whether that is within their treatment team uh, for mental health services, healthcare services, whether that is uh, supporting them in transitioning between services. So say they turn 18 and they're aging out of the youth foster care system, and they are now going to be put into an entirely different system. The YPA acts as their anchor and their bridger between services. They have their own lived experience so they can offer their own stories of hope and recovery and healing and share what really worked for them and what didn't work for them. And it's not to one up the young person, it is simply to relate and offer some, sorts of, some sort of guidance that is appropriate and it, we really go over that during the training for the white case. Um, we support uh, identifying in, individual strengths. So we try to make this as strengths-based as possible. We don't want to point out any kind of deficits in the young people, only their strengths. Unless, of course, the young person says, hey, I want to work on my confidence skills. Or, you know, I, I'm kind of struggling in school. Can you uh, support me in finding the right words to use when I'm talking to my teacher? So maybe I can, you know, uh, apply for extended test time, whether that's using their IEP or 504 plan, and so on. And they really support young people to navigate any kind of services within their community and or bridging services between different systems. Next slide, please. So looking at the values and principles of youth peer support, we're youth guided. So we acknowledge that every young person has a choice and that they should be informed and and consulted and active participants within their own lives. Mm -hmm. And also looking at large, you know, whether, whether that's policy that's going to affect their lives, whether that is policy and law that is going to affect the services that they are receiving, we want to ensure that their voice is heard and respected. We partner with young people. So we recognize that power should be shared in all sorts of decision making. And that is really based on the foundation of uh, mutuality. So we are not higher than them, they are not lower than us. We are ground level working together. And if they are down in a ditch, we are gonna hop in that ditch and climb out of it together, not by pulling them up. And maybe a little bit by pulling them up, but I'm really just trying to stress that we are down on the ground level with them. So uh, we promote independent recovery. So that means that we, we really wanna develop, we wanna support the young people to develop the tools that they need in order to make educated and informed decisions about their own recovery and their well-being. So whatever that is, is very individualized for each independent uh, young person. So there is no cookie cutter approach on offering this. It is extremely organic and holistic because no one person is going to want the same thing as another. Yeah, maybe some of them will want similar things, but essentially we want to cater to each individual need. We provide that mentoring. So not only are we trying to partner with them and uh, offer them uh, valuable services or connecting them to different services, but we also can strategically share our stories to kind of foster that essence of hope. Uh, we promote advocacy. So we can't possibly empower them ourselves, but we can give them the tools that they need in order to empower themselves. One of the panelists earlier today really beautifully stated it, that the goal of a youth peer advocate is to one day no longer be needed by that young person. It is simply to get them to the place where they are so confident and capable in their own abilities that they no longer need somebody else to help them advocate for themselves because they are so well equipped to advocate for them. We're culturally curious. You know, we want to create safe environments where that young person feels empowered and they feel like they have a sense of pride in their culture and their beliefs. And then, you know, there are a couple other ones, and I'm just going to touch on the fact that, you know, it is very individualized, strength based. And of course, we make connections. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so there are multiple benefits of youth peer support. Looking at time, I'm just going to glance over this a little bit, but data shows that young people are much more likely to turn to their peers for support than to seek help from professionals. So this was not only collected by, you know, 
clinical research, but also by young people themselves, by their direct voices. And I, for one, can attest to this fact. You know, being a young person, when I was in a support group, I would much more, I would be much more prone to share something with another young, young person off the record or outside of that group when there wasn't a provider in the room with me. Because when I was in that space, I felt like I was being judged or I feared retaliation. But when I was with another young person, I felt like I could open up. And the fact that youth advocates exist now is it so heartwarming to me. And I wish that I got to utilize youth peer services when I was involved in systems. Um, but uh, young people who have had access to youth peer services were much more satisfied with their services than those who didn't. And then when asked, young people express a strong desire for peer support services to be available to them. That is both within each individual uh, system as well as in the education system. So mental health, the juvenile justice, foster care, health care, and then also education on a grade level, and then also within college. I'm sorry if you hear any loud noises outside. I don't know if there's landscapers or if they're cleaning the street, but <laughs> that's what's going on if you hear that. Uh, all right, next slide, please. All right, so youth grad is also linked to positive social affiliations. So we try to, you know, boost that confidence. We try to engage them in services to show that we are not their only support. Yes, we want to be that person that is there for them, but we also acknowledge that we should not be their only support. And we also acknowledge that we're not always going to be available. So say we aren't available one day and that young person needs something or can really use someone just to bounce an idea off of or talk to or get support from, we want to make sure that they have a really well-rounded support system in play. So mutuality increases engagement and that goes up for all levels involved in systems. So whether you are a clinician or a peer provider, when we can look at somebody as a person rather than a subject, it really boosts that engagement. And then it also really supports the removal of stigma or discrimination within people. To see somebody else who has come out of these services, who is doing well in life, and who are, is now offering hope to somebody else. Next slide, please. Okay, so to get credentialed as a youth peer advocate, the foundation of it is that you need to have some kind of lived experience in a child serving system. Um, you also need to be between the ages of 18 and 30 years old. So for the training aspects, we have an online training uh, through CTAC. So we have level one, which, is, which consists of seven different modules and level two, which consists of five different modules. After you complete that, we have a virtual training, which is held online through Zoom. Um, and then once somebody completes that training, then there are five one and a half hour consultation calls. After you complete those, you are then eligible to apply for your professional credential. And on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the two different credentials that are available that you, it's kind of broken up the process. So next slide, please. So we do have a provisional and a professional credential. For the provisional, all you have to do is complete that level one online training. You have to have that lived experience. You have to be over the age of 18 and under the age of 31. Ideally, you will have a high school diploma, GED, associates, bachelor's or master's degree. However, we do have an education waiver form for somebody if it, they don't have their high school degree or equivalency mm -hmm. so that their supervisor will, will be able to say, I know John Smith and I have seen him offer services and, and then they will display you know, how they have seen him do that. And then they will sign off on his education waiver form and that will pretty much constitute for that requirement. We then need two letters of recommendation the only types of recommendation letters that we will not accept are from family members or from former or current providers. So we try to encourage applicants to use uh, their coworkers, their peers, um, maybe a past teacher or professor, somebody along those lines. We have a statement of lived experience. So this allows the applicant to really broadcast what exactly they went through, how it impacted their life, and how they plan to utilize that lived experience in order to support young people moving forward. And that is what I think is the most important part of the application process. And then last but not least, there's a code of ethics that needs to be signed. And that just helps to clearly state the parameters of youth care services that we all have to operate um, within in order to keep the workforce nice and uniform. Um, after that, you can apply for your provisional and begin offering uh, Medicaid billable youth care services. 
After that, there's a level two training and that virtual training component, plus the five consultation calls. Um, for the professional, you only need one recommendation letter and that will come directly from your supervisor. There's also the aspect of lived experience where we require 600 hours of documented working experience. So that can be volunteer, that can be per diem, part-time or full-time work, as long as you had a supervisor overseeing the services that you were offering. Again, we have a signed code of ethics that is required. And then after you receive your professional credential, every two years, you need to include at least 20 hours of continuing ed within your renewal application. And two of those hours has to be specifically DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion. I know we went through that really fast. So at the end, my contact information will be available and hopefully we can have some time for conversation. So if there are any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I believe I'm now going to be handing it off to Anne, or if there might be one other slides. Can we just go on to the next one? Aha, thank you. Okay, so really quickly, lived experience uh, is a very uh, large definition. So that could be mental health, inpatient or outpatient, residential. It could be, you know, involved in special ed or having an IEP or 504 plan. That could be within the child welfare system, uh, substance use services, juvenile justice. Um, receiving vocational services, uh, criminal justice uh, system, or receiving complex healthcare needs. And then there is that other that is listed. And so there, if by chance uh, none of the services listed you identify with as having experience in, in that statement of lived experience is where you really get to share what it is that you went through and how you plan on using that experience. For instance, say you immigrated to, uh, to the United States from another country. That is a very drastic change that most likely really significantly impacted your life. And so that experience is incredibly valuable and you can actually work within the immigration system as a youth graduate, supporting other youth who are migrating here and supporting them in getting services and getting acclimated to their new life. That's just one example. I can go on and on. However, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. Next slide, please. All right, and then very quickly, I'm my. Not sure I understand. Sorry, that was Siri. Um, I think she thought I was talking to her. <laughs> um, uh, my last slide. So uh, we at Families Together we offer continuing education uh, for YPAs and YPA supervisors um, in support of CTAC. So we offer those via online modules and standalone webinars. We offer different webinars, learning communities, and special topic uh, learning series. Again, in partnership with CTAC. We offer monthly technical assistance uh, meetings. So we have regional youth partners throughout New York State. So we have five, we have the Long Island region, New York City, Hudson, Central and Western, and all of them really work to cater to the needs of those youth graduates and their supervisors within those regions. And they host those monthly meetings. We offer individual support for people in order to get trained and credentialed and any kind of ongoing technical assistance that is needed from an individual applicant or from the agency uh, that is inquiring. And then on our Families Together website, we have a workforce development tab, which has a number of different options that includes the training for the career advocate credential and uh, the supervisor track and the hi hiring toolkit, the employment page, and many other opportunities if you want to check that out. But again, I don't want to take up too much time. So I am going to hand it over to Anne for her portion. Thank you all. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I'm going to use my slides a little bit differently, um, just in the interest of time, because I know we want to save some time for questions. Um, next slide, please. The, um, the, the process for becoming trained and credentialed is very parallel for family care advocates and youth care advocates. So I'm going to skip over some of that explanation. The idea is that um, you know lived experience alone is not enough to actually equip you to play the role of uh, perform the service really of being a family or youth care advocate. It's that combination of lived experience plus training plus credentialing and then obviously supervision and ongoing support and professional development that's you you know do the well, role well and be effective. So what we've tried to set up here in New York both for youth and family peers is a pretty thorough um, you know orientation to the role through training 
and then um, you know a process for documenting you know your uh, your experience and through the credentialing process, and then lots of ongoing support. And most of what Robbie and I and the other folks at Families Together do together is provide lots of opportunities for ongoing professional development. Well, I say most because Robbie does spend a lot of time actually supporting people through the credentialing process itself. But um, you know, once that's done, we don't just sort of let people go. Anyway, uh, just very quickly, the family peer advocates, um, really their role is, is what we find them doing the most here in New York is connecting with families, um, hopefully early on in the family's journey um, and really supporting them to have a voice in the process, uh, helping them understand how the system works, helping them feel like they're not alone, connecting them with other families, really trying to bust that stigma that keeps people down and keeps them from moving forward. You know, saying I've been through this and you know, my, my child, maybe now a young adult, um, has done okay or has struggled, but we're, we're figuring it out. Um, but you're not alone. And that, it, you know, really parents report so much of shame and blame as they navigate the system that the family care advocates really can play a powerful role in helping to help family members, you know, be strong and feel like they can stay, um, you know, kind of in the game uh, to support their youth. So the other thing that happens with families, if they have kids who have very significant um, needs is that they can become isolated um, and really just don't support themselves. So the family advocates spend a lot of time working on self-care and helping people rebuild connections and natural supports. So that's the family peer advocate role. And the next slide um, talks a little bit about what we mean by lived experience. And like the youth peer advocates, it's pretty broad. It's you're the parent of a child who has navigated one or more of these systems um, and you're willing to talk about it um, because lots of people have lived experience. Not everybody's willing to actually use that lived experience in the service of someone else. So I think in terms of this research conversation, one of the things I want everyone to think about is that the, the involvement of people with lived experience, whether it's youth or family peers, can really help you at a number of stages. It can help you form the research questions and hypotheses, like the questions that you think are important, you may run them by a panel of family or youth peers and they say, well, that one's good, but these other two, that's not really the issue. We want you to focus on this. And it's really worth listening to because they understand, um, you know, kind of how from a, from a user perspective. Um, and that's gonna be really important. Um, they can also be very helpful in, in conducting research. Um, we have plenty of experience finding out that um, parents and youth will speak a little bit more candidly um, with um, peers who are, have learned to do uh, interviews and run focus groups and be a part of the actual research process. Um, we've, I can't tell you how many times I've had to rewrite surveys because the family and youth peers are like, no one's gonna understand that question or this is too complicated or simply you've asked too many questions. you know. So um, as you design those studies and as you conduct the research, they can be really, really helpful and interpreting findings. Um, you know, sometimes it, you know, people with different perspectives draw different conclusions from the same data. Um, and it's really, really helpful to have, um, have them involved in that process as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, this just describes the parent empowerment program training. I hate to gloss over it because it's wonderful. If anybody wants to look at it, we can get you into our learning management system so you can take a look at it. Um, but, you know, hats off to Kimberly for getting that ball, ball rolling many years ago. And that training has served us very well for a long time. Uh, next slide. These are just the same thing Robbie talked about, a very parallel process for family peer advocates. Next slide, please. Um, and then again, this is this, uh, both Robbie and I talked about the fact that, um, you know, uh, training and credentialing is really step one. And there's a lot of other networking and support that we need to provide to both the advocates and the agencies that employ them, and even to families as they learn how to partner with the advocates um, to really make this work. Next slide. Yeah, this is just really, uh, you know, I was trying to think of all the reasons that we think this work is important. Um, and this was just a representation of that. Um, for those of you who are doing research or who work for an organization that's thinking about implementing family and youth peer support, 
one of the things that you need to be open to is the fact that if you really listen to families um, and advocates, you're going to have to change how you operate because they're going to give you feedback that probably will say, you know, ask you to challenge the way that you have traditionally done business. Um, and that's going to make you stronger. It's also going to give you a lot of credibility with the people that you serve. I can't tell you how many times we've heard from families or youth that when they found out that the agency that they were getting services from believed enough in youth and families to hire them, they, you know, kind of felt a little bit differently about the work that they were about to do together. So uh, I'm gonna stop talking because I know you have questions um, and I hope this has been helpful. This presentation has been very helpful. Thank you all so much for your presentations. At this time, Nicholas has a question that he's gonna pose to the panel. Yes, thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, I was very interested in you sharing that um, the peer program had its start in like grass mo grassroots movements. Um, and I was just wondering if there were like any initial opponents um, to peer advocates uh, that you encountered. Well, um, everyone, so, you know, sometimes it was really, um, you know, there are, there is a sort of medical model out there that um, identifies who has expertise. And these peers were showing up and, you know, there was a lot of stigma uh, that kept people from believing that they um, could play a valuable part of the treatment process. Um, so I think that there was, uh, there was, and in some you know, ways still is some resistance to, um, uh, you know, working together with peers. But I think as people see how powerful it can be, um, especially if the conversation is well supported, so it doesn't look like you know uh, confrontational, it can be really good. Robbie, do you want to add anything? I was going to say I think uh, the education requirements uh, definitely pose a, a challenge, um, being that somebody can get credentialed without having any higher education. Um, however, I have heard from individual peers who are operating at very high levels with their I think I've heard from one who has her doctorate degree, but also has their peer credentials, who has faced stigma within the workplace because they self-disclose their own lived experience or their mental mm -hmm. health diagnosis. And so I think we as a culture still have a lot of work to do and becoming more inclusive and accepting of those that have these real life challenges. Yeah, I, I will just add uh, to what Ann and Robbie said that we, we did a study a few years back about the clarity of the roles for the, the peer advocates and found that in agencies where it wasn't clear exactly what the expectations were for the peer advocate to do his or her work, it, there was a lot more diffusion and a, a lot more um, dissatisfaction that mm -hmm. getting clarity about the fact that a peer advocate is not a mini therapist or a mini clinician. They have a specific role and that specific role has to be clearly identified. And when that's the case, then I think a lot of the concerns by other members of a, of a provider team or other staff members in the agency can, can uh, be diminished. But that clarity of the role is, is really important. I just want to super quick jump in and let you know that um... We have a survey that we would love for all of our attendees to fill out. We will get back to this fantastic discussion in just a moment, but we would love to learn from you too. We love collaboration here at Open Classroom. So anything that it's a very brief survey, just a few questions. If you can fill out that survey on the link that's in the chat. And now I will let you get back to your regularly scheduled brilliant people discussing important things. Thank you, Laurie. Given the, uh, building on the previous question, given the uneven commitment to organizational culture change, my question is around readiness. What is the litmus, litmus test for organizations to determine if they are ready to hire peer support specialists? Mm. Robbie, you want to start? Yeah. That is quite a loaded question there, Cynthia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so while we have a number of different, so for instance, on the youth peer side, we have something called the YPA Hiring Toolkit. And we have a number of different resources that 
tries to uh, give all of it, that tries to give the agency and the individual employees the resources needed in order to make that culture shift before onboarding YPAs. However, are they required to go through that? Are they required to learn before they can hire a YPA? No. They can apply if they receive the, the funding for it. They can just immediately start hiring YPAs and they'll be onboarded without any kind of knowledge of what is actually needed by the workforce. I'm going to hand it over to Anne. Yeah, I mean, so Cynthia, it's such an important question. And there's, there is, uh, you know, I think there are different people feel differently about that. Um, and we want to be careful that we don't create such a high bar that nobody starts, right? Um, and at the same time, it's people to do self-assessment and be really honest about whether they have adequate resources, both funding for salaries, uh, to, you know, to make sure there's retention. Do they have appropriate levels of supervision? That's something that's often ignored and that never goes well, right? Um, have they thought about the fact, have they thought about what kind of processes they're gonna put in place to keep the conversation going about how it's working? Because even if it starts off great on day one, there are gonna be issues that come up that people that, are, that have nothing to do with it being youth. It's like, you know, it's like everything that gets implemented badly or gets implemented and then ignored, right? It just needs to be attended to. Um, but I think especially because um, these services are meant to kind of be to the, the providers of youth and family peer support, um, in addition to the individual work that they do with families, they kind of serve as ombuds people within their agencies. People have to be open to that. And if they're not, um, you know, leadership really needs to send a clear message that this is something we've invited and that we embrace. Um, and then, you know, like, I don't think you have to be in a place of perfection, but you should be in a place uh, where you're ready to, you know, engage in that conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, just real quickly, George asked, can you share the resource Robert just referred to for readiness? So at so this time, I'll turn it over to you, Mary, if you're available. I put a link in the chat um, right above. Um, I, it should have gone. Oh, no, I sent it to only Robbie. Sorry. I'll send it to everybody. I sent it. I, Robbie, maybe you can copy that. Or here, I, I, did. Can do that. I did. It's in there for everyone now. OK, great. Uh, so uh, the hiring toolkits, there's one for family peer advocates and one for youth peer advocates, and we envision them as resources that will continue to expand. Um, they can be found on the CTAC website in our self-learning center. So you register in the self-learning center, which is our, our learning management system, and then you can navigate um, to the catalog and you'll find those there. I can look at them. So wherever you are in the United States, those of you who are listening, uh, please uh, feel free to go on in there and take a look. So as we close out, I, I just want to say, because I heard Cynthia call my name and uh, I want to be sure that I really thank our presenters. I thank Nicholas for putting the, the survey in the chat um, to, to get feedback. Cynthia, as always, thank you for moderating our discussion. Thank you, colleagues. And we will share the link with all of you. Please go ahead, Lori. Yeah, just uh, agreeing with Mary. Thank you to all of you so much. Uh, I've just put in the chat the Open Classroom website. We will share the slides that were presented today. So all of that wonderful information will be put up on our website. Well, also once uh, YouTube releases the recording to us, we will put that on the website too, and it will be there in perpetuity. So you can always go back and look. A lot of times these webinars make me sad, but this one brought me so much joy because there's so much positive hope in the work that you're that you're doing and allowing others to do so just a heartfelt thanks to all of you for this important work and for sharing this with us we are super grateful to you thank you to everyone at the brown school and thank you to you for watching you're the reason we do this and we are truly grateful for your time we hope to see you next time on open classroom bye-bye